Welcome to Convention A with two days of discussions and presentations on relevant topics of the actuarial profession. We are happy to greet more than 1,000 registered uh, participants um, to this online event uh, presented by 16 partners from Europe and beyond. A big thanks at this point to our sponsor BMP Paribas for its support of this online event Convention A Europe. Now we start with our first plenary session on the digital euro. Allow me to, uh, to introduce myself. My name is Aristide Neuburger. I am a member of the board of the German Actuarial um, Association and I will be guiding you through this panel discussion today. Digital euro, what is it? Um, the European Central Bank is working together with um, the national central banks um, um, to, to, to um, look into the possible issuance of um, digital euro, an electronic equivalent to cash. It would complement banknotes and coins. It would be a central bank digital currency um, it, it, and it would give people an additional choice about how to pay. A digital euro would be a digital form of cash issued by the central bank, by the European Central Bank. So what is our aim for today? Um, we aim to give you an overview uh, on the current considerations of the European Central Bank and we want to discuss them critically. A digital euro would be a far-reaching development of the European financial system. So every actor should know about it and should take a critical look at it. So that's why today we want to give you foot for thought. We start with a little video from the European Central Bank. Imagine a digital single payment solution that could be used for any kind of payment throughout the euro area. Guess what? It could become a reality. A digital euro. Easy, safe, fast, reliable. Digital money from the European Central Bank at your fingertips whenever you need it. But how would it work? Say you've gone for a meal with a friend and you want to split the bill. Simple. Open the digital euro wallet on your smartphone, check your balance, enter the amount to pay your friend, confirm your transfer. Your friend will receive the money instantly, free of charge. It doesn't matter which country you're in or who your payment provider is. Payments are still made instantly, even offline. It's also easy to use the digital euro at your favorite local shops. Unlock your device, place it on the terminal, authenticate, make the payment online or offline. If you want, you can also use a physical card. What about e-commerce? The digital euro is also available when you're buying something online. Be it digital or physical, a euro will always be a euro and have the same value irrespective of format. Let's embrace the digital era with the digital euro. So, I'm now delighted to uh, welcome our participants to, uh, of the today's uh, the panel discussion. I start over there. Welcome, um, Dr. Martin Sammer. Um, Martin Sammer is head of the research section at the Austrian National Bank. Um, he is one of two representatives of the Austrian National Bank in the high-level task force of the um, European Central Bank. Welcome, Mr. Sammer. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Mr. Walk. Edgar Walk is Chief Economist at um, Metzler Asset Management in Frankfurt. Welcome, Mr. Walk. Thank Wall. you very much. And welcome, Professor Eduardo Beretta from the Universitat della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano and the Franklin Un University Switzerland in Lugano. His research focuses on central bank digital currencies, currency and monetary systems, history of economics and money, international macro macroeconomics, uh, payment instruments, and international payment systems. Welcome, Mr. Beretta. Thank you very much for the invitation. 
So before we start with a, a discussion, uh, Mr. Sommer will give um, a short overview about the current considerations of the European Central Bank. So let me in the next few minutes give you a very high level overview of what the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, together with the national central banks are thinking about in terms of uh, digital uh, currency uh, ideas and what the, uh, what's the current state of the initiatives and of course also what are the issues because you should think of this very much as an ongoing project and, uh, and an ongoing discussion. Now, um, Central bank digital currencies are not discussed uh, in the Eurozone alone. This is a, a wider movement all around the globe and I have in this world map uh, entered several spots of important uh, big large-scale projects like uh, in China, in the UK, in the US, in, in Brazil. Overall there are more than 100 projects going on around the globe. And all these central banks think in some way whether they should or should not issue central bank digital currencies. So uh, you might ask yourself, why are they doing this uh, at this moment and why at such a, hard, uh, such a large scale? So uh, to talk a little bit about the why in this discussion, let me uh, talk one minute about the broader context of these initiatives. First of all, uh, the last 10 or 15 years or so saw a massive entry of new private issuers of payment instruments into the payment domain. Uh, cryptocurrencies were of course a spectacular beginning, but there are lots of innovations uh, all around uh, the, the payment spectrum, you know all of them. And when um, a big um, internet uh, giant Facebook uh, started to discuss issuing its own instrument, this stirred the debate very much and is a challenge for central banks, of course. We see a general um, increase in digitalization in the economy, which uh, is accompanied by a decline in the use of cash, which is the usual form of central bank money we are using in everyday transactions. And of course, uh, in the light of the recent global conflicts, there is a heightened awareness of the vulnerability of critical infrastructures in a world of increased geopolitical tensions. And I think I do not have to explain why the payment system uh, belongs to this critical infrastructure. Now, there are three strategic challenges in this context. And I think the strategic is a, a thing that is very important to stress and to keep in mind. So central banks are thinking about issuing their own digital uh, payment instrument to the general public, first of all, to assure that the monetary system is anchored by central bank money. What do I mean by this? I mean, this sounds a little bit technocratic, but it really isn't. Uh, the money we are using every day, banknotes and coins, central bank money is state money. It's issued by the central bank, guaranteed by a state and enshrined in a very strict uh, legal framework that ensures that this money uh, keeps uh, a stable value over time, but uh, in order to make the central bank uh, able to fulfill this mandate, uh, the monetary system needs to be uniquely anchored by these currencies, which means prices must be denominated in these currencies, financial promises must be promises to this bank money. Now, states are very powerful institutions and difficult to challenge, but assume that a, a big tech company which a user base in the order of magnitude of billions enters the payment system and uh, uh, has such a large scale effect that suddenly um, units of goods would be priced in another unit, not in euro, but in some fictitious unit of this big company, this anchor would be lost and therefore the stabilization possibilities that central banks have for price stability but also for financial stability. Um, I already alluded to this big tech uh, um, giants. These are network industries with huge scale effects, uh, with large potential market power. And as they are becoming more powerful, these private players, uh, there is a certain threat to the payment system of getting less competitive, closed and a closed shop. And we need strategically to work against that. And finally, as payments become more digital, 
we want to keep open for citizens the freedom of choice between paying with private and public money. As today, when you go to the shop, you decide, do I pay cash or card? So in a digitalized future, you can uh, decide, do I pay with digital euro or something else? Now, very quickly, the ECB has uh, started in 2020 a project to think about the digital euro. I will not go through all these details. This uh, slide gives a very uh, detailed rundown of the, of the milestones that have been achieved. Keep just in mind uh, the current status. Uh, this is the second phase of a project thinking about the high-level design. Together with the European legislator, the European Commission has issued a legal proposal in uh, June 28 how such a digital euro could look like and what its features should be, and it is now discussed and negotiated. And, of course, the European Central Bank has to realize this project. It cannot decide itself whether or not to issue a digital euro. This is the issue of the legislature. But it is clear from a practical uh, viewpoint, and you are all practitioners as actuaries, that these processes need somehow to be run in parallel. Now, let me just give you a quick rundown through the high-level design features. Um, what is decided now is how this uh, digital euro, if it comes about, should be accessed, what are the payment features and what the business model behind it. Access, uh, as was already shown in the intro video, is that it should be available in several payment scenarios for person-to-person -person payments, for physical and online stores and payments from government and from government to citizens. Note that today with the digital payments instrument we have, we do not have a single instrument that has all these features in one go. For instance, with credit cards, you can buy, uh, buy at the point of sale and online, but not person to person. And I do not go through all the combinations, of course. It should be widely accessible and accepted in line with the proposal of the European Commission. Um, um, it should uh, be inclusive, so it should be realized that it can really broadly used. Um, the payment features should be uh, that um, digital euro should be uh, mandatory uh, accepted in all stores that accept digital payments, of course, with some exceptions for practical reasons. Not every small shop should have something. It should be a comfortable payment experience, and the video showed you some, um, some uh, situations very vividly, so I do not have to explain all of them. Um, Perhaps uh, a few words about the business model because the European Central Bank, of course, does not want to become a retail bank. So uh, the banking sector, the payment service providers and the banks should be our key partners in this project. And the intermediaries will be at the front line. So they will manage the customer relationship, the front ends, the, uh, the anti-money laundering, know your customer regulations, so there will be no customer contact by the European Central Bank, but the European Central Bank will issue and settle the payments and run the infrastructure behind it. It should be free for basic use, and it has a, a traditional four-party scheme where the merchant and the issuer banks can um, competitively, um, and through a market mechanism, um, create the, the fees in a way that uh, this is a viable business, but it has a public good component because the ECB will run and bear the costs of the scheme, as it does with cash at the moment. Now, so these are the takeaways, if you want. In the context of the digitalization, there are three key strategic motives for central banks. So this is the, the high-level why, why we are doing this. Assuring that the monetary system is anchored by central bank money assuring that the payment system is open and competitive, assuring freedom of choice between paying in public or private money. And these are the key takeaways about the digital euro uh, projects, design features that are on the table now. Uh, not all of them, some of them, very important issues are still being discussed, like the privacy uh, issues, this is not decided yet. So it is a complement to cash in the digital age, complement to private means of payment, the digital payment option allows everyone to pay digitally everywhere in the euro area. This is very important. And it should bring features of cash to the digital sphere and increase the resilience of the European payments and contributing to the strategic autonomy of Europe. And that's really it in a quick rundown. Thanks. 
Mr. Barretta, we heard that there are many um, central bank digital currency CBDC projects in the world. What are the experiences in, from, from other countries or are there any experiences? Yes, of course. Uh, we are talking about uh, an increasing number of countries uh, which is uh, testing on a pilot uh, level um, CBDCs. We have to think that just in 2020 uh, we had uh, 50 uh, central banks uh, dealing with such pilot projects and now there are more than 130. So we had a big jump start starting from the pandemic and uh, you know, the massive diffusion of online payment systems. Well, among the uh, notable examples, some have been already mentioned. The most one, uh, the most, you know, relevant one is uh, for sure the Chinese one. We have more than 200 million wallets have been created in E1. Uh, and of course, the Chinese government has been able to enforce the use in some cases of the E1 and um, to make it uh, more diffused on a, on, a, on a local basis. Well, um, and then of course we have some uh, niche examples like for instance uh, that of the Swiss National Bank which is running some other tests uh, together with the Bank for International Settlements um, and has uh, recently announced uh, to have uh, found a way to to keep the privacy uh, and anonymity, but uh, remaining compliant with uh, the you know uh, key YC principles and so on. So we have several levels, uh, um, but uh, several levels of research. But G20 countries, uh, 19 out of them, are already in the last stages of that uh, pilot tests. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zuma. I understand that the ECB's current considerations include some key points. You, you mentioned that the digital euro can be used Z to B in online stores and in um, 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 stores. Um, the digital euro can be used from person to person. Um, you need a digital wallet to hold it and everyone can get a, val a wallet. You can get it from a, a commercial bank or from public institutions like post offices. Uh, privacy is very important and is guaranteed up to a certain extent. And there's an upper limit on how much money can be held in the wallet, which is it, it's called holding limit and which is discussed at the moment between 500 and 3000 euro. Something like, like this, and which is for me very stoning, there's an offline functionality. Mm -hmm. So, um, is the offline functionality, is it an important point in the, uh, in the considerations? Yes, the offline functionality is part of the high-level design architecture of the digital euro, so this will be the first uh, digital uh, payment instrument at a large scale that has such a functionality. And the motivation for uh, offering such a functionality if we do this project is certainly that we want to be uh, as close as it is possible for a digital payment instrument to cash. So we want to bring cash to the digital age and we believe that the offline functionality allows certain features uh, like transaction uh, data protection which are not at the same level uh, possible if you have a, a, a pure online system. It will also be, I think, uh, attractive in terms of uh, adding resilience because it can be used in outage situations perhaps or in remote places where you have no good uh, internet connection. And uh, we are confident that this will be an attractive feature of this uh, digital payment instrument. Okay, and, and is it mandatory to have a bank account uh, if, if, if I want to have a wallet or...? No, because uh, the um, inclusiveness is a very important feature. So, I mean, in Europe we have the usual situation is that most of the people are banked. So most of the people will have a bank account. But it is not necessary to have a bank account. In the current legislative proposal and in the ideas of the ECB, it is just uh, defined to the degree that it is stated there should be some public institution for these uh, exceptional cases to make sure that everybody 
can uh, use this instrument. You mentioned post offices. This would be uh, an example, but it's not decided yet which institutions this would be specifically. So, so it would be possible for a child, for example, with 10 years without a bank account to get a wallet? It would be very practical if they the could, cash. and I think yeah. it should be possible. You, you want okay. to give, uh, you know, like pocket money to your children yeah. and you should be able to give them in digital form. I mean, if we are believing that we will be in a digital future, this applies to children as well as to adults. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mr. Walk, the digital euro seems to me work in a similar way to, let's say, for example, PayPal. So, uh, why do we need it at all? Why cannot uh, 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 existing payment service providers be used? Yeah, I think it's a very good question because the payment system is working very well and nobody is complaining that anything is missing. So, the euro is not a solution to a problem we, already, we, we have at the moment. And I think there are two arguments in favor of a digital euro. The first one is that a critical level of our payment infrastructure in Europe is provided by US companies. So we are very much dependent on US companies for our European in payments infrastructure. And given geopolitical risk, maybe we don't want to be as dependent uh, as before. And the second argument is that these um, payment system providers in the US have market power. And so European consumers are paying too much to high fees for uh, transactions. Usually consumers don't see if they pay with PayPal or with Google Pay, they don't see the transaction fee, the merchant is paying it. But when we look at the stock market in the US, the um, uh, payment providers have a market cap of around 1.2 trillion US dollar, very close to the total banking system in the US. This shows these companies are highly profitable, have market power. So it makes sense uh, to introduce a little bit more competition and the digital euro could be uh, some kind of competition. But in my feeling is if the problem is dependency on the US and market power, I think the digital euro is not the best solution. The best solution would be competitive policy. So to um, change the system that consumers have to pay the fee so that they see And I think then they will make more conscious choices which system they will use. And um, I also think that we should provide subsidies to European private solutions uh, that they can compete with the US. That would be my, my feeling. Okay. But, but, but I um, heard that, that one point in the current considerations is that there should be an upper limit for the fees if you, want to, uh, if you use a digital euro. So it is... But, but the, the point is if the consumer don't see the fees, okay, yeah. they don't... So it, I think if, if I used Google Pay and it works very well and I have the digital euro as an alternative, <coughs> and for me it's the same, it doesn't matter which I use, I probably continue with Google Pay because I'm used to it. Yeah. Only if as a consumer I see the fees, then I maybe change to the digital euro because I see it's cheaper. Yeah. So there has to be some incentive, I think, for people to change their current habits to the digital euro. There has to be something. Just introducing the digital euro is probably not enough. Maybe you allow me to react to that. Uh, two things. First, a, a very small factual correction. So. The current legislative proposal uh, is uh, determining that there will be a market mechanism for the parties involved, issuer bank and merchant banks, to set the fees by the market. There is only an option to intervene okay. if the regulator sees these fees becoming excessive. So they will not be regulated. Uh, as, a, as a, There will be a pricing mechanism there. Second is, um, to, to Mr. Walk, um, The, the, we could long discuss what would be an optimal solution for achieving this payment system, but in the real world, you know, we have much more constraints. So it is not the first time that uh, Europeans try to unify or uh, straighten their um, payment infrastructure. Because at the moment, we do not feel it as consumers, but the rails behind it are very fragmented, inefficient and expensive and critically dependent on huge foreign providers. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in theory, you could um, uh, separate somehow a, a digital form of cash and the payment infrastructure. And it is true, as you said, that the payment infrastructure could also be unified uh, in a private initiative. But the reality is that in Europe, we were not able to achieve this 
for more than 15 years now. The coordination turned out to be too complicated. And of course, if the digital euro introduces, as the ECB promises, a scheme that everybody, a unified European scheme, then we have solved this issue uh, in, in one go. And it would also be a solution. I'm not saying it's the optimal solution, but it certainly is one to this fragmentation problem. And, and, and so I, I understood that the digital euro could make a contribution, a, a contribution to reducing the transaction fees for the customers. Yeah, it must, so. because the ECB is bearing the cost of the scheme, which have now to be paid to these foreign providers and mm -hmm. uh, shift a lot of value added in payments to the US, yeah. which will then stay in Europe. Yeah. Is there a number um, a person in Europe pays a year on average for transaction fees? Is I have seen numbers from Professor Berg from Goethe University in Frankfurt and he said on average it's around 2% fee, very high. And I, unfortunately I could not confirm the numbers, but um, and I think he said between 2,000 or 5,000 euro per head in Europe as fees. Uh, so it's quite exp so we don't see how much we pay in fees, yeah. but uh, behind the scenes we pay a lot for for payments. What we know is the fees are very high and they're very secret. <laughs> Even <laughs> the ECB is struggling to find out the details. Okay, so I think he okay. made some estimations and um, uh, he, he uh, showed it in a, in a, a lecture. But the um, market valuation of the payment service <laughs> providers give us some idea <laughs> of the, the, yeah. that it must have, uh, must be very high. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the strategic independence, is it a um, very important point in the current considerations of the ECB? A, a strategic independence of other countries outside Europe? I think so, because the, you know, I mean, the payments is really a critical infrastructure. And I see, you know, I mean, uh, when the Ukraine war started, I think that it was possible overnight to detach Russia from the SWIFT system showed you there is an issue in there and we uh, it would be good if we remain in control of such a critical yeah. infrastructure because if we can make no payments the economy stands still right yeah so so a digital euro could um, 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 could promote European service provider providers what do you think I think that's the hope and probably there would be also more work to be done. So we should finish the banking union and the capital markets union. So I talked with some people from the Bundesbank and they really strongly suggested that we have more work to do because as you mentioned, there's a lot of fragmentation. And if we finish these two big projects, banking union, capital market union, then uh, it would be probably easier that European financial institution use maybe the digital euro as a way to create a European um, payment um, provider. I think that um, would be probably very helpful as well. But I, in my view, we don't need the digital euro uh, for this, but I, I, I see that there are constraints. The reality is more complex than theory, and maybe um, that's uh, maybe a good reason for the digital euro. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sommer, um, I would like to talk a little bit about privacy. Um, can we trust that the guaranteed privacy will remain um, at the long time? What? <laughs> yes, of question. course, I hope we, we can trust this, but I should maybe say a few words about these privacy issues. The, I mean, the, the ECB and the governing council made very uh, strong uh, promises that they will strive for the highest level of privacy. Now, of course, you rightly say, like, what does it mean and how can we trust this? Um, this is a chapter that is negotiated today and you should see that there is a really um, a, a huge spectrum in this. What we have currently with private payment service providers, with credit card companies, but also with your bank cards, is no privacy at all. So these uh, guys see all your data, what you buy, and have lots of information that they can use for other purposes. And I'm not saying that this is all uh, bad, but it raises issues of our privacy. So the digital euro will certainly have a higher level of privacy because the ECB is striving for an implementation where it will not see personal identities, it will not see your transaction data, it, this, it will be shielded from there. 
still, if it's going through a bank, the bank will, as with your current uh, current payment instruments, uh, have lots of data about you, which it also needs to fulfill, know your customer, anti-money laundering. Um, now, of course, if you look at it from a theoretical perspective, what a, a hard-nosed privacy activist would wish for, um, this will probably not be achieved. Also, as uh, was mentioned before, models exist that, that would implement even higher levels of privacy. Uh, basically, without going into the details, you can think about it at a high level in the following way. You could implement a digital means of payment, either like an account, something what you are used now, but technology allows also to implement today something like a digital bearer instrument, like a banknote, with very high uh, transaction privacy. Uh, so this is the other end of the spectrum. I think in the struggle for um, having this privacy, uh, we will end somewhere in this spectrum, uh, necessarily by compromise. But I think uh, the offline functionality will um, fortify these uh, privacy considerations because, you know, think about what you pay with cash today. I mean, there are lots of payments you can do, and for this, you will almost have cash like privacy, I would say. Okay. Thank but you. this is still, uh, this is debated and it is yeah. a, a critical mm -hmm. issue because, I mean, this is something the public sector can provide if he wants to, which the private do not provide at all. Yeah. It will certainly be better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Beretta, how can it be explained that um, uh, people easily disclose all their personal data to um, a payment service providers, but are afraid if a public institution gets this data? Is it, is, it, is it a European thing? Is it different in other areas of the world? No, I think, um, well, there is the privacy issue and the privacy topic is very hard felt, but um, people fear controls uh, deriving from missing privacy. So, um, and controls come from public authorities. If we think of uh, for instance, Germany, we know from official data that in 2022 we had more than 1 million uh, um, controls or monitoring uh, or requests to access uh, banking accounts, which has jumped over, over the last 10 years. Uh, which doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's negative, but people fear controls. They tend to fear less the loss of privacy because they do not see the consequence. So I think that uh, we should bear in mind that, of course, there is a privacy issue which is very relevant, which we do not see directly, but, but we could see in the future, not in democratic states, but of course uh, in, in uh, less democratic states, uh, CBDCs could be uh, manipulated or used to um, get control over over what people think and what people buy and uh, how do they spend their money. Depending how they are implemented. Of this course. is why this yeah. is so critical. Of course, yeah. of mm. course. And uh, China um, is, uh, um, since 2014, uh, very uh, engaged in uh, the research on CBDC and it's an almost cashless society because cash doesn't ensure a very high level of uh, of privacy and a lack of uh, traceability. So there is, at least for some countries, a strong nexus in that sense. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Balz, a member of the board of the German National Bank and responsible for the digital euro, said in an interview that he could imagine that payments under 150 euros would not be checked uh, in terms of, of uh, money laundering uh, prevention. Does this mean that uh, payments over 150, uh, one, over 150 euros are, would always check no. or is it, is it under no. discussion? <laughs> I think, you know, what, what the political discussion and the discussion in the ECB are trying to strike a balance between, you know, coming as close as possible to, to data protection and anonymity while being compliant with all the regulations of money laundering, customer identification, which are there and which we cannot ignore. And, you know, these discussions uh, that you cite 
come from this struggling, where the balance will be struck, I don't think. I mean, what is important is that the ECB promised to implement uh, a system uh, or variants of a system where the ECB itself will not know you and not see your payment patterns. This is, I think, or what, what the ECB will just settle and issue, and the rest is uh, with your bank or payment service provider. So we do not know what you do or what you do or what you do. What do you think? Can people re rely on the fact that privacy, however it will look, uh, will um, remain in place in, 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 in this form in the long term? Or do we have to afraid that over the long term it will weaken a little bit? <laughs> I think there is a straightforward answer to this. I mean, there are two ways how you can implement privacy uh, of transactions. Um, either you have um, a privacy promise by a trusted institution which is legally enshrined and this is a trust-based uh, privacy which can be very strong. We have it in many ways. I mean all the, our public authorities have data which they promise to protect but of course if there is a regime change they could malignly use them against us. Mm. All systems that are based privacy on trust cannot be guaranteed in the long run in the strict logical sense. You could theoretically through cryptography implement systems where the privacy of your transactions uh, is under your control, not at the institution, if the technology is implemented correctly and then you could guarantee it. But there are other issues, and in this in this complex thing, but trust-based privacy can never be guaranteed. Mm. That would have. Automated. It is the same thing that you cannot guarantee your pension if the economy <laughs> is breaking down. <laughs> That's another topic. Uh, and you cannot guarantee money if the if the society breaks down. You know, yeah. you need a certain form of st stable environment, and it's no different for digital currencies as for anything else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Valk, um, today we are, there's a clear division of the task between um, the central bank and commercial credit institutions, in which only credit in institutions ha um, handle the interaction with the customer, like, like uh, account manager and, uh, management and deposit management. Um, the introduction of a digital euro could, depending on how it is designed, make this function perhaps not needless, but could weaken it. So should commercial credit institutions be afraid that for the holding limit will weaken and money will be withdrawn from the private banking sector to a large um, uh, extent? And would the actual task of banks in the economy to provide people with cash um, uh, be undermined? I think it's a very important question. I think a lot of commercial banks are a little bit afraid that that could weaken them. And that's why there's the holding limit, because then deposit base is guaranteed to some extent. But um, I think you can make some very interesting thought experiment. So if, for example, if there would be no holding limit and all deposits would flow out of the banking system to the ECB, then basically we would come to a banking system which is very close to the idea of the Chicago plan. So you have a banking system with basically 100% um, guaranteed Or which is 100% financed uh, with um, finance from financial markets. So you don't have the fractional reserve banking, you don't have leverage in the banking system anymore, and you have a much more stable banking system. But very different, banks don't create money anymore. Uh, they have to get financing over financial markets. And the ECB will then create money. At the moment, banks are creating the money, not the ECB in our system. So that would be an extreme case. But I think nobody wants a system change. There are some economists who would prefer this system change, would prefer a more stable financial system. But I think it's a very small minority. The majority don't want to change the system. So I think it's very important to have this holding limit. But you can imagine different scenarios where maybe the holding limit will come under pressure. So one scenario would be, I think in normal times, People don't care if they use a bank account, credit card or digital euro, but in times of crisis, 
And you, I think we all remember that in 2008, um, Finance Minister Per Steinbrück and Angela Merkel had to guarantee all deposits in Germany in public. So there was, there was uncertainty about the deposit. And in, this, in, in the next financial crisis, I think if we have the digital euro, a lot of people who are nervous probably want to transfer their money to the safe asset, to the safe digital euro, and there could be a lot of pressure. And maybe there could be so much pressure also from the political side, maybe that the ECB will be forced to increase the limit to some extent. Another point would be that uh, in the pandemic uh, in Germany, we had a lot of problems to provide targeted support to private households in need because we didn't, don't have the data or didn't have the data and still don't have it. And so in the next pandemic or next crisis, the government could ask the ECB, please, increase the limit because we want to give certain households targeted support and that would be the best way, the more efficient, most efficient way to provide uh, this support. And the third point, it's not about the limit, but I mean, maybe in the next recession, ECB wants to cut interest rates to minus one or minus two percent. If the digital euro is uh, very good accepted and there's no more cash in the economy, then the ECB could also introduce negative interest rates on the digital euro so that nobody can escape negative interest rates and then monetary policy would be more potent in, in case of a deep recession. So that maybe the ideas I could think about. But I think at the end of the day, it's extremely critical that this holding limit exists and probably I think it will be, it needs to be a very strong or deep crisis that there will be an adjustment. So in normal times or a little bit crisis, there will be no adjustment because the dangers to the banking system are just too big. Because there's probably an incentive in times of crisis to, to move out of banks into, into the digital euro. May I, I, sure. I react uh, to you? I think you made three, three different points, so I start from behind. Negative interest rates, number one. Um, the current legislative proposal and various public statements of the ECB state and promise that the digital euro will not be remunerated, not positively, not negatively. So I think this is not an issue that is on the table. Second, uh, holding limits due to um, um, bank run prevention because the digital switch is so quick. I think this has been said various times and I will not diminish it, but I think this is a minor uh, consideration because you have to be aware that uh, we are already very digitized and you can move money in and out quickly independent of that Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is a case in point for that. Third, why do we have these holding limits? Why does the regulator have the holding limits? Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, as I tried to explain, the ECB wants to have the commercial banks and the intermediaries as partners in this project and with creating a new instrument that has a certain potential to have also holdings, uh, you create some competition, you're draining some liquidity. Yeah. You cannot say how much because it depends whether people are substituting cash with the digital euro, whether they're substituting bank deposits with it. It's not clear that everybody will hold up to the limits. So the current impact assessment the ECBs and the national banks are doing show that the liquidity effect will be bearable in some way. What is still open is how this holding limit should be calibrated because it cannot be the independent of the current state of the economy and who should decide on the holding limit. But this is still negotiated in the current process. But I think the general discussion always bore out that people want to have some sort of limit in place uh, to control, uh, to have a level of control over this system. Okay. And we certainly do not want to have narrow banking because we value the the, the the function of private banks in the allocation of credit. We would not want a committee in the ECB to decide who gets credit and who get, doesn't get credit. This would be no, a nightmare I, scenario. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, the idea is that banks still will, will provide credit, but not with creating new money, but with financing themselves. Yeah, but this, so it, they become will, like a, a corporate credit fund. Yeah, but this would restrain their function very much compared to today. Exactly, and I think that's why it's not realistic. But 
I think there are some economists who think that the financial system will be more stable in this environment. Yeah, as and with, we had too many financial crises maybe in the last 20 years. As with every project yeah. re related to money, you will find uh, people from all quarters who uh, implement finally their favorite utopia with this monetary model. But we are very technocratic in this sense. We want just to make the payment system more efficient and the life of Europeans easier. But still, I think it's important <laughs> to, to think about different possible scenarios, yeah. even if they are not realistic. <laughs> but, but maybe one question, sorry. Um, how do you think can you make the digital euro attractive to consumers? So there's already, they have their payment habits and now it's an additional offers coming to the market. How do you want to make it attractive that it's widely adopted? Um, we think it is attractive because it is a payment, it would be a payment instrument if it comes, who is uh, fulf uh, filling certain gaps which you have now. I mentioned that, mm -hmm. for instance, with credit cards you can pay online and, uh, and uh, at the point of sale, but not between persons. Or with cash you can pay between persons, but not online. And then with debit cards you can be in your national scheme, but perhaps not pay in Spain. And the digital euro would work in all these situations, and this could be attractive. Mm -hmm. Then it's central bank money. For me, it mm -hmm. is a very attractive form of money. It's the, the, the top, uh, the highest quality of money you can have with no credit risk. Mm -hmm. And I think if features come with the online functionality and then I believe, you know, if you have such an, a system with a common European infrastructure where you can pay everywhere, of course, it is free of use for the basic service, but then maybe banks innovate on top of that and create new services for which they can charge and make... So I have really... Uh, little worries that it will be so unattractive that it will, you know, not be adopted. But this has to be seen. We are trying hard <laughs> to, to achieve that. So, so, so privacy and um, um, the, the possibility to pay anonymous, I think, could be a, make a big change. So would it be possible, or the um, uh, wallet, um, um, is it linked to my uh, my my uh, person if i if i if i get a wallet from a post office for example or could it be possible to 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 get a wallet um uh, and to use it not linked to me as person so if you if you open um a, a digital euro wallet with your payment service provider or with your bank you have to identify yourself yeah. but the ecb will not see the transactions you are making with this wallet so you have like transaction data previously vis-a-vis -vis the ECB but not vis-a-vis -vis the payment service providers as you don't have it with your debit card or credit card now. Uh, for the offline uh, functionality of course uh, it will not be uh, linked to your person because it's on your device, it's a, it's a, it's a secure hardware element which stores uh, these, uh, these uh, digital units which you can transfer to me or to him and this is uh, like this is the cash-like uh, feature, which is almost anonymous. But 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 do I have to show my passport uh, or identity card or whatever if I if I uh, want to get a wallet in a post office? Yes. Or, or could could it be possible just to change um, uh, cash in digital cash, anonymous? Yes, this is uh, this is a functionality that should be there. Okay, and I think this would be an advantage compared to other. But yeah. you know, all these things are still open, so sure. the, the offline uh, fu uh, functionality is mm -hmm. only there at a the very high level. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we will uh, flesh out the details only as the discussion goes along. Okay, thank you. Mr. Barretta, I have a question. How could the introduction of a digital euro affect other known euro European countries, like Switzerland, for example? Well, of course, um, well, it depends on, on how it will be implemented, of course, on the effectiveness in terms of uh, monetary policy, because the digital euro um, poses also a challenge in terms of reshaping uh, the monetary policy. So I think that, uh, of course, it will be, um, it will also depend on the um, US-American response. We, we do not... Uh, 
necessarily know in detail what um, the or how the Fed will respond to uh, to this uh, to this uh, question mark, which is the CBDC uh, topic uh, itself. So I think there there are some unknown variables, but of course, um, I think that um, the digital euro could could be uh, you know uh, as a complementary solution. So we are thinking once again. Uh, about a complementary solution to, um, you know, um, revamp the role of, of cash. Because um, Europe uh, in the last years, if we think of cash, there have been uh, several cash restrictions. So to the use, to the legal use of cash, which have been adopted uh, by countries uh, uh, singularly and um, recently at the, at the European level. So I think that we have to restore trust in, in, in cash, either in uh, traditional cash or in e-cash, and uh, think also more in macroeconomic terms. So while keeping cash in our pockets or while having e-cash, we are keeping uh, central bank money, which is the safest one, which is the, the only way um, individuals have the opportunity, so non-bank individuals have the opportunity to interface themselves with the central bank. So it's, I think it's, it's a very relevant role. And of course, for, for Switzerland, which has a, a very close and embedded into an, a such big uh, monetary space, um, it, it will have somehow to adapt. Although we know that the Swiss National Bank, for instance, uh, is... Um, prone to introduce um, a wholesome uh, CBDC, so not a re on a retail basis, but just on a bank level. So there is a different type of approach in that sense. Maybe uh, sure. can I say something to that? I think in the current vision, the, ma the macro or the international macro effects of the project should be not uh, very significant because it is really meant as a, you know, in intra Eurozone payment solution to open a digital euro account. You must have a residence in the European Union, uh, in the in a eurozone country. Mm -hmm. uh, in the current legislative proposal, or if you live abroad, you need to have a, you be a citizen of the, of the. So, if if the digital euro would be used usable in Switzerland, um, this would need a state treaty between Switzerland and and mm -hmm. many and, and the states of the, uh, on the EU, and so. You know, this this could be one potential macro effect, like like dollarization, that it becomes attractive somewhere else. But I think in the current vision, I don't expect very much of that to happen. Of course, in the long run, if various countries have functioning CBDC models, and they find an international standard to link them up, the big hope is to slash uh, transaction fees in, in cross-border yeah. transactions, which are very very high at the moment. And there are lots of gains to be realized, but this is uh, beyond these uh, projects we are discussing today. Yeah, but but that would be a big difference compared to the to the uh, cash of today. So you said you you have to be a European citizen to 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 get a wallet. Yeah, you have to be a citizen in the eurozone because the, the digital yeah, euro yeah, yeah, will yeah, be yeah, in the, yes, the yes, eurozone. Yes. These are twenty. Okay, but but that's a big difference from today because to, to, today cash everyone can get. Euro in okay. yes, Cash. but it will not. Uh, I mean, if you say in in uh, are you in in a, in a different country in the U.S., the, you you can get euros, but what do you do with them in the U.S.? No, but 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 there are countries in which uh, it would make sense to pay with euro or dollar because you you um, you get something for this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, true. So, so. True. Okay. Okay, I, I, I would like to come to another point um, and the processes. So the holding limit makes the design of the digital euro quite complex, I think. So for cases in which the upper limit is exceeded by an income payment, processes must be defined. Uh, how to handle the excess money, um, you have to transfer it to a to a, to a for example, bank account and this redirection must ensure the payment in sense of civil law relationship. Um, so, and this is particularly important um, if payments um, should work offline too. So, um, 
So and 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 if um, a link to bank account is not mandatory, it's it's more complex. What to do with the excess money? So are we aren't we just thinking too complicated? Um, I think you know if you want to have a a, a solution implemented that works uh, similar to an account, uh, you want the payment instrument not to be a store of value, but a payment instrument, and you have to have a limit for this reason. If you wouldn't have these mechanisms you are mentioning to, it would be very inconvenient to use. And I think, you know, you ask me, will users use it? I, I think uh, without such a functionality, it would be quite awkward, because it, if I say, have a holding limit of, you mentioned 3,000, and I have uh, 2,800, say, on my, and you sent me 300, it would not be possible if <laughs> I to make this transaction, and it yeah. would be very awkward and inconvenient. Um, the technological experiments that have been conducted so far, the IT research behind it, I mean, you, you, you have to imagine that in this ECB project, it's not only discussed in a high-level task force, there is lots of nitty-gritty work being done and hands-on experiments show that this is possible, uh, that this is implementable, and it can be run at scale. So I am quite confident that we... Uh, we will be able to manage these mechanisms, which I think are necessary for having a smooth user experience. Okay, that that brings me to the next question. You 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 mentioned IT, so for the instruction of the um, um, uh, uh, introduction of the digital euro, many processes um, uh, need to be defined conceptually on the one hand, but on the other hand, they need to be implemented in terms of IT technology. Um, so in Europe, the IT implementation is often sometimes not considered sufficiently by the legislator when designing the processes. In, from, yeah. um, so keywords are again holding limit in combination with offline functionality. So how is it ensured that IT implementation is, is taken into account at an early stage at this project? I think the, the process that uh, is there to ensure this is that the ECB has from T0 coordinated very closely with the European uh, legislators in the sense that they have set up processes of communication, of technical advice, of uh, exchanging views, and lots of the technical work is done at the ECB together with market participants and experts, and the legislator is informed about these Thing. So the legislator at the European level or the Commission, when it drafted the proposal, has not uh, drafted this out of thin air, but in close uh, communication and coordination. And this is, of course, not you know logically, it is not a guarantee, but I think this is a reasonable process to make sure that considerations, like you mentioned, are taken on into account at an early stage. And I am confident that this will work well. Okay, thank you. Then um, um, and another question coming from um, um, one of our attendees. Um, it is just just to add, uh, just, just to be sure. It is not the idea to to change cash of today in digital euro cash. It's always the idea that the digital euro would just complement banknotes and coins. Yes, but we we are just complementing this. We want to prepare. It for a digital future, we want not to uh, withdraw or uh, uh, have an anti-cash campaign. It's one of our most successful products. In some countries, people love it. In my country, Austria, uh, people just are married to cash. <laughs> and we do not want to spoil the fun of these people. They, they can pay with our cash as long as they wish to. If I may add yeah, to sure. this, physicality has a, a very uh, strong role now, even nowadays. So when we think of uh, crisis times, people perceive physicality and tangibility of their, um, their resources uh, much strongly. When we think of bank runs, well, bank runs means that people withdraw their money from the banking system. So it's, it's very relevant to do not uh, undervalue the role of physicality even in 2024. So yeah. I agree and with that. And we learned that it is not the plan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, we, unfortunately, we must to come to an end now. Thank you very much for listening. 
I hope you have learned something about the current considerations of the European Central Bank on the digital euro. I hope we have given you some food for thought and um, thanks for listening. I wish you an exciting Convention A Europe. Bye. Thank you.